Los Angeles was arguably the most open place to form a band in 1966, and the LA band The Kaleidoscope was easily the most eclectic of them all. We're going to dive into their band history and their music here on Pop Goes the 60s. The Kaleidoscope is generally credited for introducing world music and ethnic music into rock, and they would combine all these different genres into their music, including bluegrass, folk, R&B, country, Middle Eastern, rock, Cajun, flamenco, jazz, and psychedelic. Oftentimes, these were three or four of those were combined into one song. So, what's interesting is their career in the 60s spanned four albums, and these albums hardly sold. They had five singles that did not chart, and they have members in the band that almost nobody knows. But when they blew into town, you better believe that the musicians of the area always checked them out. Now the Kaleidoscope probably could have only happened in Los Angeles during this time. And LA was the recording capital of the world after the Beatles hit in America in 1964. Record companies didn't know what the, new, the next big thing was going to be or where it was going to come from. And this created an atmosphere where record companies would take chances on bands like The Mothers of Invention, The Rising Sons, Captain Beefheart, The Midnighters, Love, Buffalo Springfield, plus hit bands like The Birds, Mamas and Papas, and even The Kaleidoscope. Let's meet the five members of The Kaleidoscope. Uh, we're going to start with the two guys who really formed the band. That's David Lindley. He's from Los Angeles. He was a guitar player, banjo, fiddle. He played harp guitar. And Solomon Feldhaus, he was born in Pingree, Idaho, but he spent uh, some years in Turkey. So he brought some Turkish instruments and Greek instrumentation, Iranian, uh, that type of Middle Eastern feel into the band. Chester Krill from Oklahoma City, he was kind of the jazz and rock guy, but he, he played basically the lead violin, viola, piano, harmonica, Hammond organ. John Vidikin from Hollywood, he was the rock drummer of the band. And then finally, Chris Darrow, who was the last member added. He's from Sioux Falls, North Dakota, on vocals, bass, banjo, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, auto harp, clarinet, and dobro. So these guys formed, uh, basically they were an acoustic, they were acoustic players. And they didn't really know how to go electric until they added Chris Darrow. Darrow was the guy that really got them plugged in. And without Darrow, they may not have been able to continue on. So these instruments that that uh, they, I mentioned that they play are rather exotic. And uh, they did have some trouble electrifying them, but they started to rehearse and started working with the amplification and started to get really good together and started to gel. The way Trester Krill describes them, he says, it wasn't just five hippies who looked alike. It was five very ugly hippies who had entirely different ways of approaching things. Now these guys really approached the band uh, with a democratic approach. There was really no leader. And it wasn't long before they had a contract with Epic Records. So they were struggling to find a name and they settled on Kaleidoscope. And it wasn't, they, they learned that two other bands had that same name, one in England and one in Mexico, but they kept it because it really fit the style of music that they played. And at this time, the producer that they hired was Barry Friedman. He was instrumental in getting the Buffalo Springfield together. So he was kind of a wannabe producer on the scene and he was the one that produced their first material. Now, what makes this band completely unique to most of any other band of the 60s is their instrumentation. And I want to just talk a little bit about that. They were somewhat aware of the fact that session players played, would step in and play, especially with new bands who didn't have a lot of experience. The instruments they played, the session players could not play, and they knew this. So here's a couple of the instruments that they played. Now, Lindley played the harp guitar. They had a couple different versions of this, of this old instrument. This guitar originated in the 1800s. A couple instruments by Solomon Feldhaus. He played the bazooki, he played the saz, and the oud. These are more Middle Eastern instruments. Four of them played the fiddle, some of them played the dobro, some slide guitar. So they were really well versed and very well rounded instrumentalists. So the first single was called Please, which is a great example of what they were doing at the time with acoustic instruments. The B-side was called Elevator Man. Both of these are written by Solomon Feldhaus, and this was more of an R&B song. Here's 
Here's what Darrow said of the, of the recording of these first several songs. We wanted to have original material that reflected psychedelic Middle Eastern kind of things that seemed so important at the time. So one of the next songs they did, they went in to record an album. And they were so well rehearsed, they recorded this album in like a day and a half or something. And one of the songs that they did that would have been an ideal single that was not released as a single is Pulsating Dream. Now that song clearly had those folk rock elements and those psychedelic elements and this, the lyrics were very mind expanding type and I thought that would have been a great single but it was not released. Uh, a couple other songs that they did that were more attempts at the Middle Eastern uh, fused with rock are Why Try and Egyptian Gardens. Now one of the highlights of the album is a song called Keep Your Mind Open. This is a psychedelic anti-war song by Chris Darrow and it makes many best psychedelic songs of all time lists. And the only sound that's heard is that of weeping wise Still love remains in some strong hearts Keep your mind open so you can see the variety on this first album with songs like Oh Death and Many the Moocher. Uh, they really thought that this album was going to appeal to a lot of people. But I mean, the singles went nowhere. Not many people bought this and um, they started to stumble right off the bat. So in the summer of 67, like a lot of other bands, the Kaleidoscope started playing outdoor festivals. One of the first big festivals was called Fantasy Fair and Magic Mountain Music Festival. This was in Marin County the week before Monterey. So they played this festival in the sunshine on the top of, you know, on this, near the top of the mountain. And the crowds were really big. They were slated actually to play Monterey and the Grateful Dead had canceled. So they had a slot open. So they asked the, the Kaleidoscope to fill that slot. At the last minute, the Grateful Dead decided they did want to play Monterey. So what happened was the Kaleidoscope ended up playing outside the grounds for like the Hells Angels or something. So they were kind of like warming up some of the crowd. And uh, that was a big disappointment to them because they really should have been at Monterey. They would have been the perfect band for that. And they really, st as they did more and more outdoor shows, they realized how well they could command the audience's attention. Now, they would play these exotic instruments, oftentimes passing instruments off to one another and playing, starting to stretch out into these really long songs, either acoustic or electrically. And they were doing this really before The Grateful Dead was. So one festival they did in 1967 was the Berkeley Folk Festival. And Chris Darrow had this to say, we could project that weird stuff across to 20,000 people on a Saturday afternoon to people drinking beer and doing acid. They knew they were good. And uh, unfortunately, they just didn't have proper management to get them better gigs, better accommodations, and maybe better material to record and release as singles. So it came time to record their second album, Beacon from Mars. Now this album, they also recorded very quickly in about a day and a half, and they wanted to stretch out even more. So they have two signature songs on this album that are really stretched out kind of jam songs. One song is electric, laced with a lot of feedback. The other is completely acoustic. The electric one is called Beacon from Mars, the title song, and the acoustic one is called Taxim. So with all the live festivals they were doing, their street cred continued to grow. And one of the things that's notable is both Lindley and Darrell would play their guitars with bows. Uh, Darrell would do it on his bass and Lindley would do it on his guitar. And so far as I know, those are, they're the first people on record doing that in the States. And the other thing they did is they had interesting use of feedback on stage. So they were able to control it and incorporate it into, into songs uh, really well. And you'll, you probably heard that on Beacon from Mars. The other thing that was rather interesting is that they had belly dancers on stage. So this Middle Eastern 
type of songs that they were doing, they would bring belly dancers on to dance on stage with them and in the crowd. So they released a second single in August of 1967, uh, Why Try, which was from the first album. And on the B-side was a very strange song called Little Orphan Nanny. Cops on the freeway, rednecking down in the parlor. Pink guys, how's me as righteous? Or is he in the cat's core if we try? So in late 67, they took a tour of the New York area, East Coast area and they actually had the opportunity to sit in on a session with Larry Williams and Johnny Guitar Watson. Now they were recording for OK Records and OK wanted to go mod. So these two R&B guys wanted to have the Kaleidoscope back them on the song called Nobody. And this is one of the great fusions of psychedelic and R&B that you'll ever hear. Mm. The song Nobody was recorded in October of 67. It was the same month that the Kaleidoscope released their third single called I Found Out, a great old folk, kind of folk rock song that was written by Earl Shackelford. So while in New York, they started to hang around with the Mothers of Invention and you know Frank Zappa showed them around a little bit and they knew each other from Los Angeles anyway. They hung out with uh, Zal Yanofsky the Love and Spoonful, started hanging out with some of the, the rock stars there. And they were touring New York and for their New York debut, they were playing at the scene. And for, how, how's this for a bill? It was the Kaleidoscope, Nico, and Tiny Tim. So quite an eclectic uh, bill that night. It was at this time when they were visited by Leonard Cohen, who happened to be in New York at the time, was looking for a band to back him up on his first album, The Songs of Leonard Cohen. So he found the Kaleidoscope playing uh, at the scene, and he asked them if they would back him up, and they did. So they backed him up on several songs on his first album, but were uncredited. Uh, two notable songs are So Long, Marianne and Teachers. With all these things happening, it seems like, oh, this, things are going great for the band. Leonard Cohen, and they're playing with Larry Williams and Johnny Guitar Watson. And Larry Williams had written those songs the Beatles love, like Slow Down, Dizzy Miss Lizzy, Bad Boy. But what happened was <laughs> their management was pretty lousy. They weren't getting very good paying gigs. They weren't topping the bill. Their accommodations weren't good. They got their instruments stolen. And Chris Darrow decided to quit the band at this point. Now, one of the things uh, that Darrow had working against him was he was the last member of the band to join. And they weren't really playing his numbers live very much. Even though he probably had the most commercial stuff out of anybody in the band, his stuff would have been perfect for singles. They weren't put on the singles and he wasn't, they weren't playing them live much. The sound of the kaleidoscope was a little bit more styled around Solomon Feldhaus's singing, that kind of gravelly voice and some of the Middle Eastern sound. So Darrow decided, hey, I'm broke. I don't have any money. Uh, my instrument, my, two of my guitars just got stolen. He got a, an invitation to join the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band back in LA. So he jumped at the chance to join them. Okay, with this major personnel change in the band, we're going to stop the video here and pick it up in a part two where we talk about the Kaleidoscope's second half of their career. More great music to come here on Pop Goes the 60s. Mm -hmm.